us to do it for nine. Uh, we use over five billion tons of coal, 30 billion plus barrels of oil. That's 100 million barrels a day. When we try to think of biological processes or any process to replace that, it's going to be a huge challenge. Then, of course, there's all that uh, CO2 from this material uh, that ends up in the atmosphere. We now, from our discovery around the world, have a database with about 20 million genes. And I like to think of these as the design components of the future. The electronics industry only had a dozen or so components. Uh, and look at the diversity that came out of that. We're limited here uh, primarily by a biological reality and our imagination. Uh, we now have techniques because of these rapid methods of synthesis to do what we're calling combinatorial genomics. Uh, we have the ability now to build a large robot that can make a million chromosomes a day. When you think of processing these 20 million different genes or trying to optimize processes uh, to produce octane or to produce pharmaceuticals, uh, new vaccines, uh, we can change just with a small team, uh, do more molecular biology than the last 20 years of all science. And it's just standard selection. Uh, we can select for viability, chemical or fuel production, vaccine production, et cetera. This is a, uh, a screen snapshot of uh, some true design a software that we're working on to actually be able to sit down and design species uh, in the computer. Um, you know, we don't know necessarily what we look like. We know exactly what their genetic code uh, looks like. We're focusing on now a fourth generation fuels. Uh, you've seen recently corn to ethanol is just a bad experiment. We have second and third generation fuels that will be coming out relatively soon that are sugar to much higher uh, value fuels like octane or t different types of butanol. But the only way we think that uh, biology can have a major impact without further increasing the cost of food uh, and limiting its availability is if we start with CO2 as its feedstock. Uh, and so we're working with designing cells uh, to go down this road, and we think we'll have the first fourth generation fuels in about 18 months. Sunlight and CO2 is one method. But in our discovery around the world, we have all kinds of other methods. This is an organism we uh, described in 1996. It lives in the deep ocean, about a mile and a half deep, uh, almost at boiling water temperatures. It takes CO2 to methane using molecular hydrogen as its energy source. We're looking to see if we can take captured CO2, which can easily be piped to sites, convert that CO2 back into fuel, uh, to drive this process. So um, in a short period of time, we think that we might be able to uh, increase what the basic question is of what is life. Uh, we're truly, uh, you know, have modest goals of replacing the whole petrochemical industry. Uh, you know. If you can't do that at TED, where can you? Um, become a major source of energy. But also, we're now working on using these same tools to come up with instant sets of vaccines. You've seen this year with flu, uh, we're always a year behind and a dollar short when it comes to the right vaccine. Uh, I think that can be changed by building combinatorial vaccines in advance. Here's what the future may begin to look like with changing now the evolutionary tree, uh, speeding up evolution, uh, with synthetic bacteria, archaea, uh, and eventually eukaryotes. Um, we're a ways away from improving people. Our goal is just to make sure that we have a chance to survive long enough to maybe do that. Thank you very much. Mm. Mm. Unbelievable. Okay. Unbelievable. We're going to sit here. Come on. Craig, you have an incredible way of just saying in a very calm way stuff that will probably change not our lives, but there's <laughs> far children in the world to come. It's, it's an unbelievable talk. Um, help me understand a couple of things, and we're going to have some questions from the audience uh, in a bit, so uh, be ready in a few minutes to put a hand up. 
Um, short, crisp questions, less than 30 seconds. Um, you've, you've discovered all these millions of genes and organisms in your ocean voyage, all of which do things that really we weren't aware of. Why, why not use some of those organisms rather than designing from scratch? Is that whole process really necessary to achieve these incredible goals you have? It's an important question. I mean, right now we are finding a lot of biodiversity. We find organisms in the environment that actually produce octane. You grow these in the lab, they smell like a, a gas station or a diesel, diesel tank. But nothing ever evolved to produce the kind of quantities we need. And the scale is what's really important. So we were thinking of making micro refineries. So if you make a micro refinery that makes 20,000 liters a day, you need one million of those to match what we use in oil. So the scale is what's critical. And it's, mm. well, metabolism can change by a thousand to a million fold in the lab. Uh, it's not clear anything can really work on the scale that we need. We and others are trying to change existing organisms now. That's a stopgap to get going. The ultimate will be chemical design. We're talking to most of the chemical industry that use oil and coal as raw materials mm. to see if it can switch capturing CO2 back uh, in these processes. So I think we eventually have to get to biodesign uh, and to optimize these, we absolutely have to do that. So there's no reason why nature itself would have produced bugs with exactly the properties that we need right now? It, in fact, that's why photosynthesis is so ineffective. It, in fact, if, if things produce things on the scale we need, uh, you know, this would be a methane planet, for example, huh. not a uh, oxygen-driven one. Huh. And so. Um, you've got this three-part process for uh, creating synthetic life. T two of the parts are completed. The first part was the... I mean, you, you basically proved that you could move uh, a chromosome, a natural chromosome, from one bug right. to another and reboot that bug. And we've made now the chemical molecule and they're making even larger ones. So we are now booting up the chemically made chromosome. And that would I, I be think the that's a technical difference, but that'll be the third uh, absolute proof of the whole process. Um, so right, right, yeah. right now in your lab, scientists are trying to take the, that huge chromosome you referred to, insert it into um, another, a, bacterial another cell. bacteria, and hope that it boots and, and basically starts yeah. reproducing using we, we that We try chromosome. not to base too much on hope, but... Uh. <laughs> but but, how, but I mean, how is it? Are you waiting... <laughs> I mean, do you have your cell phone switched on waiting for the, for the call? Is this a big, surely this is a big deal for you when... when yes, when yeah. It's, there are very slow experiments. It takes about six uh, weeks or so uh, because these cells, being so small and so limited, grow very slowly. Uh, but uh, I think it will be exciting when that is uh, booted up, and I'm sure it will happen this year. Uh, but there's a lot of barriers to doing this. Uh, the, the combinations have to be right. You have to have the right restriction enzymes. Uh, cells, you can see maybe why they would have evolved to not want this to happen if you can lose your entire identity just from having DNA exchange. It would, it would change the nature of sex quite a bit. Uh. <laughs> so, so, um, <laughs> so, so when that's happened, um, so, so when that's happened, you then have this ability to, you, you've got your, your uh, a chromosome that you can then add different design elements on to try out different life okay. forms. T talk to us more about that, that process and how, how it is right now. I mean, right now, is it possible on a computer to say, we think that this particular chromosome will generate a bug that does X? Yeah, we're absolutely using software to design the pathways, the metabolic organisms, all the aspects we want in the cells, and we're building those pathways. So it is absolutely based on computer design. It, even trying to change existing cells, you have to put in whole new chemical pathways. DuPont spent uh, 10 years and about $100 million changing about 16 different genes and E. coli, where they go in massive uh, tanks going from sugar to propane diol. Uh, we're trying to not just do it by trial and error, we're trying to do it by direct design. And, and I think it will change the process, change the efficiency, uh, and get us there much faster. But think of this as an iterative process. You know, a lot of people like to think in terms of genesis, or oh, we're creating life from scratch. We're using one of the key tenets of life. All life derives from other life. 
we're using that three and a half billion years of evolution. We're just trying to take it over now with new software to take it very rapidly in new directions. So the first cell, now you can design it so it can easily take new chromosomes, new material to get to the next stages. So we'll, we'll see an exponential change in the pace of the sophistication of the organisms and what they can do. So, so just building on that, I mean, you, um, you, may, you had that interesting slide up saying software that creates its own hardware. Yeah. Just talk about that a bit more, because someone might say, this isn't really new synthetic life. All you're doing is you're, you're, you're writing code. You're, you're making a computer disk. You're not making a computer. Um, well, we're definitely not creating life from scratch. It, it's, an, it's an intellectual concept. We absolutely start with digital code in the computer, make that chemical molecule. We start with four bottles of chemicals but we are absolutely dependent on having life evolve to this point to be able to take that software and read it. So it's like if you had a piece of software and you had